My name is Bob Alco. I'm the president of SCAD Research. I'd like to say good evening. Thank you for coming. And I would like to uh, introduce the chair of this national scandal, as well as helps with all the other scandals that go on around the United States. Uh, we'd like to ask Carol Zitch if she can come up here and introduce her team that she works with to get this all put together. This is the woman. <laughs> so we'll smile. Okay, okay, yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah, you got me just as I was walking out the door. So, um, yes, thank you all so much for being here. Um, it's yeah, it's been really fun putting this all together, and um, we've got. <laughs> Okay, some days. <laughs> that didn't sound convincing. <laughs> and we're just all really excited that we're waking up tomorrow morning very early and, um, and, and doing the second part. So we appreciate you guys all being here. I wrote down names because I was afraid I was going to forget. Um, okay, so the 2019 National Planning Committee, Deb and Megan. Sarah, where's Sarah? Sarah Trolley. <laughs> Natalie. Um, Kim. Kim's right back there. My best friend since we were 18 who lost her sister to SCAD two years after um, my heart attack. So, Lydia. <laughs> and, um, yeah, a special thank you to Michelle and Tracy. Michelle's always there to find me a photographer, an MC, whatever we need, and Tracy, who has volunteered for the third year in a row to be the MC tomorrow. So thank you, Tracy. <laughs> um, did I miss anybody? No, okay, all right. So yeah, guys, thank you so much for coming and um, hope you enjoy tonight and tomorrow. Thanks. Oh wait, I did, Jan. <laughs> And Jan, of course, yes, we could, none of us could do this without Jan. And Laura Meyer, who's not here. Jan and Laura were the original two um, planners for the first 5K, and we haven't let them off the hook yet, so. <laughs> All right, thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, listen, I'm, normally I come up and talk to you, and basically my, uh, the, the theme of my story is we have a long way to go, and we, re we really got to push and hard. But, you know, since um, a lot of people identify me with SCAD, I have to tell you, I, get, I see a lot of email, a lot of people talk to me, and I, I want to tell you tonight that we have, in my opinion, and I've talked with Mayo a little bit here about this, we have actually turned the corner on trying to figure out what's going on with SCAD research. Because I've gotten stories, and I want to tell you one story. I was in Sarasota for the SCADL, and a, mo a mother and father came up to me and said that their 37-year-old daughter woke up with acid reflux, she got the whole family off, like a mother would always do, got the whole family off to work and school and everything like that. She went into work. She really wasn't feeling good. She said, I'm going to go home and work from home. On her way home from work, she saw a med first a little clinic. She stopped at the stoplight. There was, she was in the city, crowded with cars, the light, because she had to stop at a red light. When she came to, she came to because she heard somebody beeping behind her. There were no cars on either side of her. There was only the guy behind her beeping, saying, let's go. So she knew something wasn't quite right. She got into med first. She was telling 
the receptionist, you know, I've I got these feelings, and I, and she had monitored herself with one of these Apple watches that tells you your heartbeat, and it will tell you uh, if it's continuously um, increasing, and that you should take aware of uh, notice of it. And what she normally used to do is she'd see it, she'd see it going up, she'd find a quiet place in the corner or something, and she would go. Okay, now I do my relaxation techniques, talk, self-talk, how to relax. She was doing that and the numbers were going up. So that's what she was telling the lady at the main desk. Meanwhile, as it turns out, it was a doctor from behind her, heard her, came out of the door from behind her and said, come over here. Gave her a chewable aspirin, said, chew this, come in here. He put an EKG on her. He said, I've got an ambulance on the way. You're having a heart attack. They took her from the ambulance straight into the catheterization lab. They did the cath, and they said, you're having a scad heart attack. And that is the story, I think, that primarily gave me a lot of hope. That doesn't sound good because she's having a scad heart attack. But let me tell you, now I get stories about how people are diagnosed and diagnosed accurately and quickly. And when we started this eight years ago, that wasn't the stories I would hear. I, we would hear the most horrific stories, and then we'd all sit and say, all right, what can we do? How can we get this going faster? Well, now our stories are very, very good. These doctors are recognizing it, and the more you recognize it, the, more, the better off it is for the patients. In fact, we just registered a person today. I won't say who it is, but they, they had one person that lo they lost to a scat heart attack. Another person had one. And somebody they worked with just had a scat heart attack two weeks ago. So we gave them some of our literature, and they're going to bring it back to their, the person. It's, the word is spreading, and you don't have to explain it too much anymore. They understand it's a tear in an artery. It doesn't have to, you don't have to be um, old. I mean, this lady, the lady, first lady I told you about was 37 years old. And the last one I'll tell you about, which I think is sort of fascinating, is show you all the work you guys have been doing, all this volunteering, all the donating. We got an email, and I think it's up on our website, from a woman in Sudan. She said for 20 years she's had AFib and angina. But as most of us do with little these aches and pains, you learn to live with them. Doctor gives you something, you know, you take it, you feel fine. Said, so one day she said, you know, this, this is different. I've been doing this for 20 years. Today's different. I think I'm going to go to the hospital. She went to the hospital in Sudan. As soon as they got her, did the cath, they said, you're having a scat heart attack. She wrote back to us. She said, I feel blessed that I found you people on the website. I'm already in the Facebook group. It just does wonders for me. And that all came from, we, from what you people did. Getting together, meeting each other, growing your networks, and holding the SCAD events that we do. Our SCADLs pay for the research that is helping you figure out what's causing SCAD. So I just wanted to tell you, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Dana Swenson Dravis, and uh, I um, am with the Mayo Clinic in the Department of Development. Um, I uh, um, am so happy to be here today. Um, it's really my pleasure to be here along with Dr. Hayes, as well as the rest of the Mayo team, uh, to spend this evening with you, uh, the many SCAD survivors, uh, your su supporters, as well as um, our, the, the families of our SCAD angels. Uh, we're excited to be participating in the 8th Annual National uh, Chicago Area 5K Skedaddle for Research. And we want to recognize SCAD Research, Inc., and thank Bob for his vision in creating this wonderful organization. Uh, together, we are really making a difference. In the past seven years, SCAD Research, Inc. has donated more than $800,000 to Mayo Clinic in support of SCAD Research. So, 
Sharon, would you like to say? I would. And you're going to see this in some of my more formal remarks, but for those of us who are here who have been there since the beginning, and the beginning for some of you is before we were doing research. So Dr. Tweet and I really started thinking about this in 2009, publishing about this in 2011, and engaging more and more of you and our colleagues at Mayo Clinic and across the country and across the world in this work because of the work and the support that we have had because of both the money, because research takes money, but also because of the participants in our research who without you, and there are many of you in this room, we wouldn't know what we know. And what Bob said about the turning the corner, I sometimes think we're never going to get there. There's so much to do and so much to learn and so many questions that I feel we need to answer for you. But there are a lot of questions that have been answered. Maybe not as much as we want, but enough that it has changed the treatment so that people who come in with a heart attack that's due to SCAD today are like the case that Bob said. She didn't know she was having a heart attack, but someone both said, I'm getting you to, to the hospital because you're having a heart attack. And then she got to the cath lab, and that interventionalist said, whoa, I'm not going to do anything here because this is a SCAD heart attack. And I know what I'm supposed to do, and I know what I'm looking at. We know that at national meetings, SCAD is being talked about by smart people, like lots of cardiologists and interventionalists and radiologists and obstetrics and gynecologists. And a lot of that is because of the impetus that you all in this room and beyond, and those on the Facebook Live and those who are going to watch this afterwards, who have inspired us as researchers because I wasn't doing SCAD research before 2009. This was not my life's work. Somebody asked me about my story earlier today, and I'm happy to share that at some time, but this is my life's work now. And <laughs> and I can say it is Dr. Olson's and Dr. Tweet's life's work who are here tonight. It is where we spend a lot of our free brain time trying to think about how we're going to answer those next questions. So uh, we're going to talk about what we've learned. That's part of what the program tonight is, is to share what some of the support that you have and the participation that you have and how it's driving. I think you're also going to hear, we're not across the finish line. You're going to make it tomorrow, I promise. <laughs> it's only a 5K. You can walk it. We are not there with the research that we need to do. There are too many other questions that are out there. And with each new insight, discovery, finding that we don't do nearly as fast for me or for you, another question pops up. So we are committed to continue to drive this research and the care of SCAD patients and to better understand this because we don't want it to happen. Ideally, we've learned the cause so we can prevent it, but for sure that we knew the optimal way to treat it when it happens and how to prevent a second one. And we don't have answers to any of those right now, but that's the holy grail, and we're working on it. So thank you all. Bob, if you would mind coming up, we have a gift for you from Mayo Clinic. I have to go collect it from under my chair because I. Thank you, Bob. Thank you for creating this wonderful organization and for uh, raising awareness of SCAD and uh, impacting the lives of so many people. Thank you. Thank you. And I pre I'll take this uh, in name of all the board and everybody that's volunteered because. It's a volunteer organization, and it's for everybody. Thank you.
So I wanted to acknowledge the folks at Mayo, and so we have a number of people who have come who are actively working on Mayo research. You heard me mention Dr. Tweet, who's going to be speaking tonight, and Dr. Olson, who's going to be speaking tonight. And then we have Jill Boyum, who if you're a research participant, I didn't see where she ended up sitting, but she is sitting next to Dr. Olson. So Jill has been our study coordinator extraordinaire for several years, and anybody who has been a part of research knows Jill. Now, the sad thing I have to say is that this is Jill's, well, I won't say it's her last skedaddle because, but she is moving on. She announced to me that she had already sold her house and that she is pursuing other opportunities, not at Mayo and in Mississippi. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> so, um, I wanted to, this to be a celebration because Jill has, um, has really contributed so much to what we experience and how we have been able to do our research. But I know that many of you have Jill stories about how she listened on the phone to you or she facilitated a transfer for you to the right person. So um, let's celebrate Jill. Stand up. So we will have a great study coordinator here next year. <laughs> um, but I really do think that it is the teamwork that we have had and been available um, to, to do this research. Uh, one truly gift to me and many of us who have had our careers at, at Mayo Clinic, and Dr. Olson and I were talking about this on the drive over today, is the fact that the reason we stay isn't because the weather's great. Um, the reason we stay is because of the colleagues who often are the ones who see that an idea or something, and they pitch in, even if it isn't really, I mean, I can't tell you, and I, Dr. Olson is the, the poster child for somebody who pitched in when I, I, I said, I think I've got something here, and do you want to help? He was doing a completely other type of research, and still is, but has embraced SCAD and driven it forward, and you're going to hear about that tonight. I also want to recognize some of the new folks on our team. So Kurt Brekwa, who is back in the back, raise your hand, another Mayo person. So I didn't even know Kurt was coming because he didn't tell me in advance. You just saw him here because he has joined our research team to help with some of the data analytics, which is really important when you're trying to source out some of the things. And then Dr. Olson is going to introduce some of his team, but particularly we've got a PhD student, Tamil Turley, who's over there with her family. And she is a PhD student who she is doing primarily SCAD research genetics work. That is what she is doing to get her PhD. So there are people who are super committed to what I know you in this audience really care about. So I wanted to just talk about, because I agree with Bob, we have a long way to go, but there's some corners that have been turned. And I can't tell you how um, my heart warms when I read a report, a cath lab report from somebody who's been diagnosed with SCAD, and I'm seeing them in clinic, and I read that, oh, the interventionalist said, and this is not Mayo, this is somewhere else, this is a classic SCAD. Like, how long has classic been? Like, nine years? Like, this is a classic SCAD. And I'm going to treat it this way because I know this is the way that we should treat it. So that doesn't happen to everyone, but it is increasingly what we need to do. So um, thank all of you for this. And so we would like to um, continue to share. And I would say to any of the wait staff that these people are hungry and you can, they're not supposed to be <laughs> waiting to eat while we talk. So we will not, if plates are clanking, we're fine with that. We're good. I also want to say that, honestly, we, we feel that we male people, we feel kind of part of the SCAD research and the SCAD community. We're not really, and we don't want SCAD, but we feel that we have been with you enough to get you in a way that is really important to us. And, you know, I've been there. This is the, the annual photo, so um, we have to have that photo. <laughs> Carmela's coming tomorrow, right? <laughs> yes, because when she first showed up in my office, I said, so what can I do for you? And she said, I want to have a baby, and they told me I couldn't. 
I didn't say she could, but we worked through it, and so that's the SCAD baby with. <laughs> And I'm, I did bring that tutu, but I'm not putting it on tomorrow. But it, Ellen Robin, who couldn't be here tonight, um, wanted to be from, but she gave me that because she said, I, you would never wear a tutu on a scad walk. I, I did, and I finished it. So. so we've talked about how important the funds that are raised through SCAD Research, Inc. drive this. Research does cost money. I mean, we can give our volunteer our time, but honestly, running blood samples and running DNA and looking at that, that actually is something that requires a cost transfer. So let's go back to 2009. So this is when I was first approached by some um, SCAD patients who said, um, what is Mayo Clinic doing? And in, the, in cardiology school, what I learned is that SCAD is really rare. It mainly happened to pregnant individuals and that no one could really study it because even a big center like Mayo Clinic because it was so uncommon. There were a lot of publications about SCAD, but they were all done in the pathology literature. And if you know what the pathology literature is, that means that they were able to get tissue from a dead person. So that was not, I, I've talked to some of you, maybe in the audience, who had your SCAD 10 or 15 years ago, and you went on Google and you looked at SCAD and you stopped looking because when those first hits came up, we thought it was really rare, and people who were having it were getting vastly different advice. Like, it's a fluke, go on, live your life, run a marathon. Or others who said, we're treated with kid gloves and not allowed to do anything. We know now that neither of those approaches is healthy, good, or right. So what's changed? Well, this has changed. The work that we are doing that was patient-initiated we're collaborating across the world. So Mayo Clinic is involved in, um, in studies that are involved with Stanford, with England, with others, so that we can gain the most by pulling together all of our resources for a rare condition. I talked about the new hypotheses because if you learn something, then that's just another reason to ask another question. We do know that still, even though cardiologists, and particularly interventional cardiologists, are pretty clued in, what we also know is we still have a ways to go with OB-GYNs, with women's health, with internists, with EMTs, with emergency room uh, staff, with patients recognizing symptoms of a heart attack. You'd think that was a basic, and we've known that, and you can look at the American Heart Association, you know, with all the signs and symptoms, chest discomfort, radiating down the arm, up the neck, chest pressure, shortness of breath, sweating, all of those things. But women are still having these symptoms and not seeking care, and they are having these because they look like many of the people in this room, young, they don't look like a heart attack person, and they don't get taken immediately back from triage into the emergency department. That's a gap. So we are here to answer those questions. And we'll talk a little bit about some of those questions. So this was one of the early, this was actually, I think the first poster, it was. So you can see this arrows going and I've, no details, but this is when we first reported, Dr. Tweet's the first author, and Dr. Galati, who couldn't be here, who's our, one of our interventional colleagues, talking about, wow, this social networking, we can maybe look at what a rare disease looks like. This is one of the first graphics. We had our Mayo graphics people put together. It doesn't really look like this, but sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words when you're trying to explain to somebody what something is. Because just run around saying, asking people what SCAD is and how many people can tell you. This study was early on. We recognized when we started seeing popes, and the very first questionnaire that we sent out to research participants had numerous, and those of you who have filled out those, numerous questions about mental health, quality of life, stress, and others. So we published that, and this was a, when my daughter was still an undergraduate, but well, a, a graduate student in psychology, so she was a co-author, and we presented this poster together. We've come a long way, and Dr. Tweet's gonna talk about some of the work that we're doing most recently. So I showed this picture to Dr. Tweet, and she said that was number three, two. That was number two. She's here with her five. She's such a superwoman. Um, but 
we, this was where SCAD kind of came out to the national meeting. So AHA, that's American Heart Association. This is a national annual meeting, which back then it was just in a little poster form, like that's nice. Now every single major national cardiology meeting has a session on SCAD about what's new, how to treat, and how, how we need to drive the research. American Heart Association does, American College of Cardiology does, Heart Rhythm Society does, all of those do now. So that's important when you've got other scientists talking about this. So we've also been very successful in a number of these publications. And I know some of you have read some of these publications. Some of you have walked them into your doctor's office. I am not recommending that necessarily because they are full of medical jargon and scientific jargon and other things. But that's the currency of cardiologists and scientists, is scientific peer-reviewed publications. And the one that we're, you know, and, and I wanted to highlight this one because this came very much out of this group, is women were saying, you know, I have chest pain after I have my SCAD, but I have it around my period. And my doctor says, he's never heard of that. So we'd heard it so many times, we went back and published it so no doctor could say I haven't heard of it because we can refer them to the actual publication. So we've had a number of publications and some of those may seem to you in this audience as really incremental. Like that didn't add a lot. That's how science works though. It is really rare that there's some breakthrough and says we've cured cancer. We've done this. It is insights that require further information. We were very, very excited, and some of you who were here last year, when in 2018, we published an American Heart Association scientific statement. So the American Heart Association, that's our big journal, Circulation, this was a collaboration across continents, a consensus statement of what is known that we can add to the literature. This is a cookbook or a a really a guidebook for physicians who are caring for patients with SCAD. It's the one where it says, this is what we know, this is what we don't know. You should get this kind of imaging after you have a SCAD. And I will say that there were, of the many authors, three were from the Mayo Clinic SCAD registry. These are just the publications from the past year, since we were last here. So we have not let up we continue to. I'm not going to talk about these individual pa um, studies because my colleagues are going to talk about them, but I particularly wanted to highlight this because Dr. Olson might not. So one, Dr. Olson was a, the first author. There were co-first authors. And the reason he was awarded that prestigious place in authorship is because Mayo Clinic and his DNA samples contributed more than the other two, the other centers almost combined, and was able to do a deeper analysis that elucidated many things that were really important in understanding. So I'm going to let him, I'm not going to steal his thunder, but he won't talk about how much that his lab and Dr. Turley, well, she's not a doctor yet, but she's going to be really soon, um, were able to bring to bear. So as we go forward, and the, I, I like this too because Dr. Tweet is now being asked to comment on other studies about SCAD. So, you know, here she started as this medicine resident doing it. Now she's like a world's expert and they asked her to write commentaries and articles that speculate because she too, through this work, is a world's expert. And this is the most recent poster that she presented. And it's not just the science, but SCAD has come into the forefront in the media as well. So a couple of years ago, WebMD did an online publication about SCAD, and they interviewed a couple people. Yeah, there you are. And Ellen Robin. They called me and they said, you know, this is getting more hits than virtually anything else we do. We're going to put it in the print magazine. And then they circled back around and said, we're going to update it because this is one of the, the topics that has had the most hits and is most popular and most interest. And so they revised it and add some additional patients for a revision in 2019. And actually, um, uh, Kristen O'Meara, who's in the center there, um, 
She's actually a cardiac nurse at Mayo Clinic who told her story. So it hits really close to home. Kristen and I have worked together in the Echo Lab since I was a cardiology fellow, and we have daughters who are the exact same age. So it is something that affects everyone. Women's Health Magazine. So think about Women's Health Magazine. For those who've seen it, it's aimed at like the 25 to 45. So it's aimed at young women. That's the demographic who are reading it. Um, Dr. Tweet said I should have showed this video. You can go online and look at this video. But we had this SCAD session at the American College of Cardiology, and they said, you know, Dr. Hayes, will you be interviewed on the street? And if you do that, you'll see random people walking behind me. But the headline was, on this med page, was SCAD finally getting its due, because that was kind of how I framed it. It's like, yeah, we're, we're here. We've turned the corner, to quote Bob. We're in Time Magazine and Time Health. And this piece of art, um, which was Danielle Denline, some of you may know, um, she, this is her own artistic. She said I could use it in any way I wanted, but it's her representation of what SCAD means to her. And it, she's had a sort of twisty, turny, um, but she's still there, and she's posing for pictures. So to give you an update on our research, we have well over 1,100 enrolled in our research. I mean, Jill remembers, Marisha remembers. We said, if we get 200, like, that would be in our wildest dreams. We kept having to um, revise the IRB to allow us to recruit more individuals. We're pulling the same things we did at the start, plus more, plus many of you have gotten a follow-up email asking you to participate in other studies. If you actually come from a, for a Mayo Clinic visit, we have some prospective studies, like doing imaging on ECHO and others, where we can include to drive the science. I did want to remind you, and I know some of you, is this is a registry. This isn't a clinical trial. There is a difference between the registry, and some of you, ha I know, had an idea that you would send your materials, and all of a sudden we'd send you back an answer about SCAD. Unfortunately, we were starting at such ground zero that what a registry really is, is pulling together the data of all 1,100 plus people, pulling that out, and then starting comparing line by line by those questions that we've asked you to better understand what is more common? What are some of the connections? And out of that, we have learned about migraines and published that, about menstrual angina, about some of the mental health um, issues where we were pulling it. But this is not something where you turn around the next day and you have an answer for you. We wish we could do that, and we are talking about what we might be able to do to have that prospective trial. And I'll, I'll, I'll sort of make the point that Bob gave the happy story, and this is the story of a woman who suffered and saw three different healthcare providers before she was diagnosed with her SCAD after walking around as an outpatient when there was evidence that she had an elevated troponin. And those of you who've had a heart attack, that's a very sensitive blood test. And if your troponin is elevated, you have had heart damage, except for a few occasions. And she was sent out of the hospital as a 42-year-old lawyer. And it was only five days later when her SCAD was, and I can uh, use her name because she was quoted in the WebMD article. So some of you know that the other hat I wear at Mayo Clinic has to do with diversity and inclusion, one of the many hats I wear there. And a lot of it has to do with helping us understand what might prevent us to being our best selves as doctors, as nurses, as people who coordinate, and, and we do have this unconscious bias about what a heart attack patient looks like. And it's still, generally, male and gray-haired. It is not the vibrant young women who sit in this audience who had a heart attack. And that's something that we continue. That's not a research question. That is changing hearts and minds, and you all talking about, I am what a heart attack looks like. And it could happen to other people, and I want you as a healthcare provider, an EMT or a cardiologist or an ob or an ED doctor to recognize it when I come in with classic symptoms of crushing chest pain. I don't want to be turned away. So we are here tonight because of you. We continue to feel the wind beneath 
our wings as we drive forward. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Tweet, who's going to talk a little bit more about some of the science that she's been doing over the past few years since last year. Thank you, Dr. Hayes. And I'll just make note that the reason why I'm doing this research is because of Dr. Hayes. So she approached me when I was a medical resident in internal medicine. I had an inkling that I'd want to go into cardiology fellowship, and we were already working on some research together. And she asked me, would you, you know, like to help me do this research on SCAD? And I didn't really know what SCAD was, but I said, sure. And I envisioned in my brain, you know, maybe a year project, you know, present a poster, maybe get a manuscript, someday go into private practice, and instead it ended up being a huge component of my current career. I spend a lot of time working on SCAD research. I am supported by our um, Mayo Clinic in that I have both a departmental grant that supports a project that we're doing, but also um, have what's called a Birch Award, which is an NIH uh, award um, to support this research and I never envisioned that um, but it is because of Dr. Hayes inviting me and because of the compelling stories and because of you that I'm still working on this and I'm very passionate about it. So when we again to kind of think about how has the science changed, uh, how many of you are familiar with PubMed? It's an online resource to look for research articles. It's often what many people go to to look for articles in the literature. If you look at this chart I made here, you look at the year. That's the year of publication, OK? And then on the y-axis, you see the number of publications. So if you put spontaneous coronary artery dissection into PubMed and look at when articles and how many articles were published per year. You can see, say in the 1980s, there weren't too many, you know, maybe three, four, five. And then you can see as you keep going along, it just keeps escalating to the point that I would say it's exponential. And if you see where it really started growing, it was when we really started um, working on a lot of the SCAD research. And I'll just say here, that's two, 2019. So we're only in June, and we already have that many publications, if you use SCAD as a search term, in PubMed, and we're not even finished with the year yet. One thing I wish I added was our Mayo Clinic publications, because I can tell you a lot of our publications have substantially contributed to the literature. Um, but this has also incited interest of other centers and academic institutions that have started research as well, which is fantastic, because the more we know, the better. And what I'll do with these next few slides is just kind of do some highlights of just the past year, 2018, 2019, because we're very busy. We have a lot of people engaged in doing this work, and a lot of people have become quite passionate. So one of these projects is about the early natural history of SCAD, which was published in 2018. And one of I'll just go over the highlight. I won't go through everything, because I don't want to bore you. But this is a picture of what we would think of as a coronary artery. And one of the things that we've learned by systematically looking through hundreds of angiograms is that while we think of SCAD as being a potential tear in the wall, we also know that it can be a blood pocket in the wall. And one thing that Dr. War Waterbury and colleagues learned, including ourselves, our team, is that we think in some people, you actually get the blood pocket and then the tear. And that's something we learned by looking at hundreds of angiograms in series. In addition to that, we also found that you can medically manage SCAD because it will heal, but it is also important to watch some people because some people will actually get worse first, in which case sometimes you need to do an intervention. This is another paper that was published uh, recently in 2018, and this was looking at CT scans of the heart for SCAD, especially when it's happening at, you know, at the very first moments, and what we did is we looked at a bunch of imaging with our cardiac radiologists. I'm also trained in cardiac CT. And what we did is we looked at the characteristics, because some people say, oh, you don't need an angiogram, just do a CT. But there's a lot of concern that it could be missed. And one thing we found was seeing a clear dissection was only present in 14% of the studies we looked at. And in fact, there were other characteristics um, for SCAD on CT, and we published this just trying to educate people, especially cardiac radiologists. If you're looking at SCAD, these are some of the characteristics. 
And we provided lots of images and examples trying to demonstrate that to our imagers, which I think is very important. We also looked at cardiac MRI, another imaging technique of the heart, and showed what SCAD would look like on MRI because there are no other studies about this currently. And an important finding there was many times SCAD will look like a typical heart attack on MRI, but two patients in this series who had SCAD, their MRIs were perfectly normal. And to us that was an important learning point as well because in one case in particular, the diagnosis was delayed and people were kind of dragging their feet and they said, well, the MRI is normal. And so it was a teaching point that we really emphasized. As part of these studies, we've also been trying to focus on characteristics of, well, can we help predict who may do better or worse um, and features to potentially predict even another event. So this is a picture of Alexis Johnson. She's a medical student and she did a fantastic project looking at mental health in patients with SCAD. And I want to highlight two things. I'll go over some of her um, results with you because many of you may have participated in this survey. Um, but it was presented recently at the American College of Cardiology Scientific Sessions and we are working on putting together the manuscript for publication. But one thing I want to emphasize is this is a medical student who's going to go into um, emergency department medicine. So she's going to be an ER doc, an emergency room physician. And one of the things I love about working at Mayo is we have so many learners and we are a teaching hospital. So she will likely go perhaps stay at Mayo, but I know she's looking at other institutions. She knows already a lot about SCAD as a medical student and will go on to teach her future students, her colleagues about SCAD doing this work here at Mayo Clinic. And um, we involve a lot of trainees and we see that happening. They're going to other institutions, they're teaching themselves, they're becoming the local SCAD experts. And that's a wonderful part of our team and our collaboration. With this study, she sent out um, surveys that we worked together to put together and received over 500 responses. And this is primarily looking at mental health, PTSD. And of the responses, there was an average of 1.47 traumatic events reported. And about half of them were linked to serious life-threatening illness. And for most, it was their SCAD. Most of the PTSD that was noted was mild, but 11% had moderate or more PTSD. In addition, we looked at anxiety and depression. And many scores were minimal to mild, but in 17% there was more than moderate anxiety, and in 15% there was more equal to moderate depression. And we found that higher symptom severity correlated with both a younger age and lower quality of life. And these are some high points. There's some additional information provided by this data, which will be included in our publications. But I think this information really helps us just better understand what's going on, trying to figure out what can we do to help our patients, where do we need to focus our efforts in our future studies, and also just teaching others. This is uh, Dr. Colleen Lane. She's one of our cardiovascular fellows. Someday she will be an interventional cardiologist. Whether or not she stays at Mayo, I don't know. But there's a possibility she may go work elsewhere. So this is another example of a trainee who will and already has a well above average knowledge of SCAD, who will go out and share her knowledge with others and actually is already doing so. She's looking at sudden cardiac death in SCAD and looking at the role of implantable or wearable cardiac defibrillators, which is really important. She also presented this at the American College of Cardiology just recently in March. And again, I'm not going over all the results. Both of these studies have a lot more results than I can share with you at this present moment. But she found that sudden cardiac arrest occurred in about 10% of the patients in our registry. Um, but also found that recurrent sudden cardiac arrest was uncommon, 1.5%. And she also has a lot of other interesting findings, but I just wanted to point that out. And that information, again, is helpful because we're making these difficult decisions every day in clinic. Um, and it means a lot to an individual in regards to what should we do. We have a lot of ongoing projects. We really are interested and want to focus a lot about recurrence and predictors of risk. We find that a lot of patients we care for are concerned about this, appropriately so. 
Pregnancy after SCAD is a frequent uh, question and it's something that we are closely looking at, primarily with the registry data. We are looking at uh, the narratives that many of you sent in. Again, the focus of that is to look for themes that we may have overlooked. You know, we are learning a lot from you and um, the science advances when we listen. And so that's what we try our best to do. Uh, autoimmune diseases is another thing that we're looking at in the setting of SCAD. Atrial fibrillation, physical activity. So the autoimmune diseases, that one was not one I expected to do, but it's actually a rheumatology fellow after I gave a talk teaching the residents who came up to me and said, I really think this is interesting. Can I do this project? So we went through all the appropriate steps and are working together on it, and I'm, I'm very excited about it. But again, this is a rheumatologist, a future rheumatologist learning about SCAD and trying to advance the science in SCAD. Uh, physical activity is a common question. So again, another research priority of ours. Uh, I'm an imager, so novel imaging. Um, here's an example of one of the um, echocardiograms we're doing. We're trying novel techniques, include some, including something called contrast um, imaging. And then also the genetic studies, which Dr. Tim Olson will share more about with you. And that's not all. Um, there's more we want to do. I put this picture here. Um, it's outside the ACC Heart House. Of, it's called Man Helping Man, but I think of it as Person Helping Person. Is really, we're just trying to work together to kind of improve the world together, but in this case, really work to learn more about SCAD with the goal of helping others, primarily those who are affected by SCAD and their families. Um, but we learn just as much along the way. I've, I've uh, gained so much from this experience. I, I, it just drives the passion even further because I want to continually give back. Um, our goal is to continue to collect long-term data of those in the registry because I think a lot of people say, well, how am I going to be doing in five or ten years? If we are able to track many, many people for many, many years, we'll be able to answer those questions a lot more accurately. Follow-up questionnaires will be part of that, have already been, but we're working on overhauling the IT infrastructure of our database to even be better at this. As you can imagine, and that's what a lot of my NIH funding is going towards, because as you can imagine, this started as a trainee, you know, putting together and de-identifying data on my own, and we're working at making this uh, much more mainstream. Um, but of course, we do welcome status updates in addition to the questionnaires that we send out requesting for follow-up. We like to know about new medical or personal information. Sometimes people move and they don't tell us, so we try to get follow-up and we can't get a hold of them, and I'm trying multiple different phone numbers. Because we do, even if you're doing well, we want to know that. That's really good information to know. Because if we can tell a lot of, you know, if we say the majority of people are doing awesome at five, 15 years, that's really encouraging to say to someone who had a SCAD yesterday. So it's important. But if we're also seeing concerning things, like another SCAD, that's just as important to know. And also to try to sort out what about those who are having additional SCADs are different than the ones who don't? And are there ways to prevent it? And that's a huge uh, initiative in terms of things that we want to find out. And then there are these future goals, exploratory biomarker or hormonal studies, clinical trials is definitely something we're talking about and they're on the horizon. Um, and I thank you for your attention. I'm going to hand it off to Dr. Olson. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here tonight and uh, share with you uh, this event. And, and I'm very excited to be able to share some new data with you with respect to our genetic studies of SCAD. So our driving hypothesis is that there must be a cause for SCAD, and we think that genetics plays a, a prominent role. Um, the evidence for that is the fact that people who have SCAD uh, frequently lack traditional risk factors for coronary disease. Moreover, there are some rare instances of families in which two or three individuals have SCAD. So this suggests to us that there must be genetic underpinnings to SCAD, at least in some cases. So the aims of our uh, study is to create a DNA repository, that is to collect samples from blood or cheek swabs um, that contain each person's genetic code. 
and then to use that DNA to identify SCAD-associated genetic variants. Our long-term objectives are to discover the biological mechanisms of SCAD and to contribute to identifying a risk profile and perhaps even preventative treatments based on our understanding of the genetics and the mole molecules that are disrupted in SCAD. So really our work begins with the registry that um, Dr. Hayes and Dr. Tweed already described. And so to be able to study genes, we need to have very good clinical information at a, as a starting point. So the great thing about the DNA repository is every person that's provided a sample, we have very complete clinical information on. Um, and the diagnosis has uh, been well vetted. It won't surprise the people in this room to know that um, people with SCAD are a very motivated group of people. And in fact, 80% of people who have enrolled in the registry have enrolled in the genetic research study. That's a remarkable participation rate. So what's quite remarkable is that for an uncommon disorder, we have a remarkably large cohort, meaning we have almost 1,000 people who have provided a sample of their DNA for our genetic research study. Um, this group is comprised of mostly women, 96%. 16% of people have had a recurrent SCAD event, and 12% had their SCAD event during pregnancy or shortly thereafter. In addition to that, 519 parents or relatives of people with SCAD who have also a vascular disorder have provided a sample for our study. And finally, we have uh, 12 families in which two or three members have had a SCAD event. And this is the basis for which we are carrying out our genetic studies. So I think this map really uh, encapsulates the, the breadth and depth of participation. So this is a map of, US, of the US, of course, that shows each and every participant in the United States. Every one of our 50 states is represented, so um, our, the, the reach is, is wide. But it's not just confined to the US, it also incur, includes international participants. So uh, over 12, uh, people from over 12 countries have also provided uh, samples for our genetic studies. So this slide provides um, a conceptual framework of how we think about the potential role of genes in blood vessel disorders. And so I've shown on the slide two extremes. So on the left side is Marfan syndrome. Marfan syndrome is uh, a disorder that leads to aneurysm of the ascending aorta. And this is clearly recognized as a hereditary disease. It's caused by rare variants or mutations in a single gene. It runs in families, and I don't think anybody would question the fact that this is a primary genetic disorder caused by a single gene mechanism. On the other hand, we have coronary artery disease, and this is coronary artery disease caused by plaque buildup, the more typical coronary disease. And while this disorder has some genetic causes, it's more complicated. Environment plays a much bigger role in this type of coronary disease. Smoking, diabetes, high blood pressure are major contributors. And the genetic contributions are caused by the coalescence of many genes in more common variants. So where does SCAD fall in this schema? Well, our best guess is that it falls somewhere in between, that it has a genetic component, but also environmental influences. So how are we going about trying to identify genes that lead to SCAD? Well, we're taking two approaches that really look at a person's entire genome, that is their entire genetic blueprint. One technique is called whole genome sequencing, 
and the other approach is called a genome-wide association study. Sequencing is expensive. We can't do that on everybody. And so one of our priority areas is to sequence everyone who has a family history of SCAD and individuals who have had recurrent SCAD. The premise being that there's going to be a more strong genetic signal in that subgroup of, of individuals. Genome-wide association studies, on the other hand, um, are required, uh, require a large uh, group of people. So for these studies, we're including everyone who's provided a DNA sample, and we're comparing the genomes of people who have SCAD with people who don't have SCAD, looking for more common genetic variants um, as opposed to whole genome sequencing where we're looking for very rare genetic variants. <clears throat> So what is whole genome sequencing? I've already touched on it, but it begins with providing a DNA sample. We have a core facility at Mayo Clinic that sequences an individual's entire genome, which is comprised of three billion nucleotides, so-called letters that uh, spell out the genetic code, 2,000 genes, and every individual, whether they have SCAD or not, has one million variants amongst these three billion letters. Um, and so the challenge of whole genome sequencing, now that we've overcome the technological challenge of actually sequencing a person's whole genetic blueprint, is to filter through these million variants and determine which ones are important in SCAD. And so we filter for those variants that are rare, those that impact the gene function, and those that, uh, that occur in genes that are highly expressed in coronary arteries. And by doing so, we identify a group of genes that are candidate genes for SCAD susceptibility. So one of the major advances over the past year um, is encapsulated in a paper um, that was uh, just published, uh, with the first author being Timiel Turley, who is a graduate student in my lab. This study began with a family case, um, and through whole genome sequencing and the filtering I described, we identified um, a variance in a gene called TLN1, which makes a protein called Talon that was the most likely culprit gene in this particular family. What is Talon? Well, Talon is a protein that's highly expressed in the coronary arteries. So in the upper right-hand figure is a cross-section of a coronary artery from somebody who unfortunately died in a motor vehicle accident. The coronary artery is normal, but there's an antibody that stains for this protein that uh, shows up uh, a brown, and you can see in the middle layer of the coronary artery, this talon protein is, is very highly expressed. In the diagram below, it shows the uh, talon is a part of a complex of proteins that form a scaffold in the cell, the so-called cytoskeleton. So in the same way that our bones give our bodies structure, the cytoskeleton gives the cells within the wall of the coronary arteries their structure. So it was genetic defects within the gene that makes this protein that were identified in this family. We then did, went on to screen in a targeted fashion for additional rare genetic variants in the same gene in the large cohort of patients who have sporadic SCAD or non-familial SCAD, and indeed found that about 1 to 2 percent of people with SCAD have a rare genetic variant in one of the key functional domains of this protein. Um, but like with any research, um, as much as we answered some questions, we introduced additional questions. What we determined is that uh, many of these uh, individuals who had a talent mutation, whose parents participated in the study, had inherited the same mutation from their parent who hadn't had SCAD. So the question remains, why is it that the person who had SCAD got SCAD, and why did their parent not get SCAD? But this is a starting point. This gives us a target to be able to study what are the modifiers that determine why some people who have this gene mutation get SCAD and some don't. 
It's now well understood that fibromuscular dysplasia and SCAD uh, coexist with one another. Um, FMD is very common in people with SCAD, and interestingly, both have a strong female predilection. So in 2016, there was a study focused on FMD that looked for genetic markers that were linked to FMD, and a marker was found on chromosome 6. Mayo then participated in an international study that was comprised of um, investigators from our institution, from England, France, and Australia. And collectively, we pooled our resources and studied the genes um, or the DNA of over a thousand people with SCAD across the world. And what we had the specific question, does the same gene that confers susceptibility to FMD confer susceptibility to SCAD? And the answer was yes, um, and in a very strong fashion. And so interestingly, the same genetic variant that confers risk to FMD confers risk to SCAD. And this was just published in the Journal of American Co College of Cardiology earlier this year. So what does this gen genetic marker on chromosome 6 tell us, i.e., what are the genes that reside in this region? Well, there's actually two genes of interest that this marker identified. One is called FACTA1 which makes a protein that forms the cytoskeleton. So what's very interesting about this is we now have two genes, the Talon gene that was identified through whole genome sequencing, the FACTA1 gene that was identified through targeted genotyping, and both genes encode proteins that are important in the cytoskeleton of the, of the cell that forms coronary arteries. The genetic marker doesn't affect the protein, but it affects the expression of the protein. In addition to that, there's a next door neighbor gene on chromosome 6 that encodes a protein called endothelin. Endothelin is a protein that regulates the constriction or dilation of blood vessels. And indeed, this same marker affects the expression of that gene. So it may be that this marker affects the uh, expression, or we know that it affects the expression of two genes, both of which are known to be very important in the structure and the function of coronary arteries. So what is our research in progress? What are our goals for the next year? Well, our first is to complete a SCAD-focused genome-wide association study in the same way that a study was carried out for FMD. And for this study, we're going to study over 700,000 genetic markers in 650 people with SCAD and 1,800 people without SCAD. And essentially, we're going to look for which markers are enriched in people with SCAD versus those that don't have SCAD. And hopefully, we can identify other genetic markers beyond the one on chromosome 6 that confer risk for SCAD. As I mentioned, we're also carrying out whole genome sequencing in uh, family SCAD cases. And so we have 11 other uh, families that are participated in this, our study that have provided DNA samples. And we're in the throes of examining their whole genome sequences to identify yet other genes like Talon that might be important in SCAD susceptibility. And then finally, we're carrying out whole genome sequencing in our uh, patients who have recurrent SCAD. Again, the premise is if you have a second SCAD event, it's perhaps more likely that there's going to be a dominant identifiable genetic basis. And so for this study, we're going to carry out whole genome se sequencing on 120 individuals that have recurrent SCAD and then determine if there's a single gene or related network of genes that confers susceptibility to SCAD recurrence. Well, we can't do this research without a team and without funding. And so I just want to acknowledge the critical contribution of our team at, at Mayo Clinic and especially a call out to Tamil who's a graduate student whose thesis work is solely focused on identifying uh, genetic underpinnings of SCAD. Thanks so much for your funding. Um, SCAD Research Inc. has funded the vast majority of the research I've 
described here this evening. In addition, we have funding from the Heller Foundation and the Mayo Center for Individualized Medicine. So with that, I thank you very much for your uh, support and I thank you for your, your passion that really motivates both me and the people in my lab and on our research team. So while you are eating your dinner and perhaps getting dessert, we will take a few questions from the audience that you have, and I understand maybe some from Facebook Live. What would you tell people who have uh, daughters, um, many daughters, who, uh, well, what's the current thinking of uh, hereditary? I'll start with that because I can tell you, and Dr. Tweet can step in and also weigh in, is that I can tell you that many people who have had SCAD and know that this is a female predominant condition want to know what should my daughters do, not do, or what screening or whatever should be done. First, I would say, based on Dr. Olson's um, and our observation, familial SCAD is very, very rare. We've got over a thousand folks and, you know, 12 families. So, in large part, this is not something, it's obviously a natural concern, but not something that we then go digging down. It's not like 50-50. So it's very unlikely that there will be familial SCAD. I'll say that to start. Two, we don't go searching for genes unless the mom has the genes, right? So we would, and less than 4% of individuals who come to our medical genetics clinic and are tested with a standard panel have one of these identifiable genes. So there's not really a role to have your daughters go and have genetic testing, obviously, unless the patient with SCAD had an abnormal gene. And third, I would say, some people ask, should they be screened, should they have x-rays? And the answer, again, is no. As many of you know that if you had SCAD, maybe it was recommended that you have um, screening of your arteries from your brain to your pelvis. And that is the current guidelines. But that's because we know that a, a, a substantial number of people who actually have a SCAD event, over 50%, are gonna have some other abnormality. It would be potentially harmful to take young people, expose them to the risks of x-rays and other things for something for which we would not need to treat. Because many of you who have perhaps had screening, you found, yes, I have FMD, but it's really mild and there's no treatment needed. So that's a long way of saying it is an appropriate concern to be worried about your children if you have had SCAD, but it is not one that should occupy your mind because the likelihood that there would be familial SCAD is very, very low. What else do you say? I agree completely with that. And one other thing I would add, should she maybe not have kids? And what I say is no. You live life the way you would otherwise. Don't live in fear of something that may never happen and is unlikely to happen. But make sure you educate your family so that, let's say, your daughter does have chest pressure one day. She doesn't just ignore it or let people dismiss her. Oh, I was just going to ask, um, what is the observed um, recurrence rate of SCAD? So if you look at all published cohorts, you get kind of a variety of percentages debating or depending on how it was statistically an analyzed and how long the follow-up. So between 10 to 20 percent. When we look at the registry most recently, um, and this is kind of estimate, uh, about five year estimate is about, we're getting about 16 percent, depending on how you do the analyses yet again. Okay, so usually what we quote is 10 to 20 percent. Sometimes you hear that number and you say, oh, every year I've got a 20% chance of having another SCAD. Remember, this is spread over time. So often, if you do the math, you know, 3% per year over time. One of the things we know that would be really important to know, does the risk go down? If you make it out 10 years, is your risk lower or is it all up front? That's a question that we do not have the answer for, but I think now we have enough numbers in our registry that that's something that will be looked at um, going forward. Because that's a critical question that we know all of you have. Jen? So I have an online question. Uh, the question is, is SCAD data being collected in other parts of the world? So absolutely. So 
we have the largest registry at Mayo Clinic in the world, but it, there's increasing interest from South America. Brazil has got a registry. Vancouver with Dr. Saw has a very large registry. Dr. Adlam in um, Leicester, England has a large registry. And Europe is kind of coming together, particularly with the EU countries, even countries like Poland and others are starting to pull it together. That's how we're going to leverage um, the knowledge because even though we're not calling SCAD rare anymore, it's still relatively uncommon. And so we're going to, to really make progress, we're going to need to work together. There's also a big registry in Australia. Got it. Hi, yes, yeah, so I understand that even over the last few years, the preferred treatment for SCAD has, has changed, or at least uh, it's changed somewhat. My question is, what's, what's behind that change? And for the people who had the treatment before the preferred method now, what, what are the positives and negatives for them? Yeah. I'll start with that, and then I'll, I'll also let Dr. Tweet weigh in. So let's just take you back before we knew SCAD was really different and when we were underdiagnosing it. So the guidelines for treatment of a heart attack was, if it's a STEMI, so the most severe, you have to have them in the cath lab with an artery open within 90 minutes, okay? That's like a national standard. So the standard of care is you get them to the cath lab, you see the artery, and even if there's decent flow, because we know if it's plaque, like grungy stuff that's not gonna go, we need to put a stent in that. So that's the way that SCAD patients were being treated. Before Dr. Tweet's first author paper uh, that really showed that, wow, when we're treating a regular heart attack, we have about a 95% success rate with that approach, going in and, and opening it with a, 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 a stent. We only had about a two-thirds success rate when patients had SCAD and we did that. We had a scratching our head, right? Because these weren't all patients treated at Mayo. This was our registry. This was from all over. This was confirmed by an Italian study that had very sim similar studies and Vancouver. So we know that going in, and so you think about it, this is a torn artery, a fragile artery, and we were going in and putting catheters and wires in, which often made the situation worse. So the first thing was recognizing that there was a difference in outcomes in the treatment that was currently being recommended to treat patients. The next was trying to understand why. So we spent a lot of time, Dr. Galati, Dr. Best, Dr. Sweet, looking at angiograms and saying, well, sometimes it was a problem with the wire going down the wrong place because you had this split and, you know, often these are, and, or the tortuosity. So there's a lot of reasons why the outcomes might be worse. But the main reason to change the treatment is that at least a proportion of the patients would heal on their own without doing anything. And so by recognizing this is SCAD and if the flow is okay down the artery and the patient is stable, that is now an acceptable treatment if it is SCAD. It still wouldn't really be an acceptable treatment if this was a heart attack due to plaque. And that's why making that diagnosis. I think it would, I don't want to mislead you because there are patients with SCAD who definitely need to have their artery opened. The artery is completely closed. The patient is unstable and, and, and in shock. And then we have to make hard decisions sometimes. We know it's gonna be a more difficult procedure but we know we have to open that artery. So it's not cut and dried. We also know that those people that we watch, that we say we're not gonna do anything, we know that about 10% of them will go on to have more problems and will end up needing to do it, which is why we, the recommendation to keep people in the hospital if we don't do a stent. So that's a little historical background of what we thought we knew and why this has changed. But it was not just us observing this, it was like, they do worse, and some will do really well with doing nothing, and that's been a bit of the change. Do you have anything to add? No. Other questions? Oh, I have a few. <laughs> um, the percentage of SCAD being seen if there is an event in a carotid dissection. So I'm, I, I think the question may be that if once we do that vascular scan, how, how many others might have a carotid dissection? I'm not I'm sure. But the reason that we do, that we recommend looking at other arteries after a SCAD, and this doesn't need to be done emergently, is in some cases we find another condition that requires treatment. 
And um, in about 70% of individuals, we find some other finding. Some of it's very mild, doesn't need treatment. About 50, 50 60% might have the condition fibromuscular dysplasia. I think the actual dissection is more about five. Yeah, it's considered. I don't, I don't remember the exact number offhand for carotid dissection, but we do report it in a table by um, ourselves. It's our group, but Dr. Mega Prasad was the first author on that who's the issue is that many of these dissections we find were asymptomatic. So you think about how, you know, I, when I, I think, oh, my, the, the artery to my neck dissected. It's a pretty big artery. And thinking back, some of these patients say, oh, yeah, I had some neck pain there. They diagnosed that they didn't, but they didn't have a stroke. They didn't have anything. So we know that asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic dissections can occur in other arteries, and that's kind of why we do the, the scanning, because we may need to follow those. And, Yep, and aneurysms. I just wanted to know, what is there a standard follow-up protocol, or what are the tests that your cardiologist should be doing to just to identify and prevent maybe any further, you know, problems? Well, th I think right now uh, there's probably not a standard. I would say that um, after SCAD, patients should have the vascular screening, so that would be important. And it does uh, patients after SCAD should get cardiac rehabilitation. Right. Really important. Um, the medications that they do are tailored to any other conditions that they have that are unrelated, that may be related, like reduced heart pumping function or others. So the medications are going to be customized for that patient. The AHA consensus statement that I showed really outlines a lot of this for your doctor, so I encourage that. For any type of heart attack, even if somebody's doing great, I like to see them in about a year to reassess their medications and their status to, and see if we can drop some medications or if we need to adjust them. I guess I would say there's not really a protocol other um, beyond that because every patient, regardless of the type of heart attack, is pretty individual. Um, but, uh, but that's sort of an overview. Do you have any a more specific question than that? No, it's just, my doctor did not do the vascular scan, and I was just wondering how, yep. yeah, that should be a standard. That should be. We, yeah. we believe that, and it is in, okay. the, in the consensus document. Okay. Back when we used to try to do these, you'd have to fight with insurance to have it covered and so forth, and now we've had enough data out there to say it's justified and necessary that we don't run into that nearly as often. Thank you. Another online question. Is there any explanation for excessive chest pain? Excessive, excessive chest pain? No, I'll let you start <laughs> a common question. <laughs> So what we and others have found is about 50% of patients after SCAD are going to have chest pain, which is much higher than somebody who has a regular type of heart attack. My experience is some of it's clearly non-cardiac. I mean, I can press on their chest and it, it, I can reproduce it. That's not heart pain. That's chest wall pain. But there's a certain group that may have chest pain when they exert themselves, and that we need to reevaluate. Do they still have a blockage? Does their stent have a problem? And then there's this broader group who have chest discomfort that really sounds like angina. It sounds like the type of chest pain that the heart's not getting enough blood, that needs treatment with medication. And we think it's because the arteries are not, they've been damaged by this split. And instead of re relaxing and letting more blood flow through, perhaps with that endothelin that Dr. Um, uh, Olson was talking about, it's dysfunctional. So when they need more blood, it's either not allowing, expanding, or it's contracting or spasming down. So we don't understand the full mechanism of this yet, but we do know we have some effective treatments for most women, um, but it's different than the t way we treat people who have fixed blockages. Often people pass their stress test. They have a normal coronary CT. So their doctors, if they're thinking, oh, the only reason I would be treating them if they had a blockage, and what we know from SCAD patients is they're much more likely to respond to medications even if they do pass their, their um, stress test. So it's probably a problem with the lining of the artery. The one thing I can say is chest pain is very common, but it really does improve over time. And for those of you, and I know there's some in the room who had lots and lots of chest pain and eight ER visits in the first six months, are now having it minimally or not at all. And so there is, we believe, perhaps some healing and a better understanding uh, and adapting to the body. And I would yeah. 
That was an excellent explanation. And I think we think about this a lot because it's a common question. And we try to treat with medications, sometimes can get it under better control, sometimes struggle quite a bit. And in addition to what Dr. Hayes said, other things I think about are the menstrual chest pain syndrome. So what is the role of hormones in terms of the vascular receptors? So the coronary arteries do have receptors for estrogen and progesterone, and what are the mechanisms there? And also neurologic, there can be neurologic components to this, um, but it is a challenging question. And the other thing is um, we have found that after a SCAD, many have this sense of hypersensitivity or cardiac awareness that you just had a heart attack that completely struck you out of the blue, and now you're aware of every extra beat, every little twinge. Um, and so there's a component of that as well. Lots of questions online here. And I have to say there are people from Australia watching, so that's pretty cool. And, and you're going to have to tell us, you bosses of the program, when yeah. you want us to stop. So, Because um, you guys got to get up and run. <laughs> that's right. How do I get my cardiologist to order FMD testing? I ask him every year, and he says no. Okay. All right. So I have two answers for that. One, there's evidence. So I think helping that individual who may not be up to date because this is new science, um, understand what the current guidelines, getting a second opinion. Um, I think that I, I'm a big fan, whether it, even somebody who comes to Mayo, if, if it's a high stakes condition, seeing a different cardiologist um, may be something that you can do. Um, any study project about stress and SCAD and or correlation between between SCAD and cortisol levels oh, yes. and other adrenal activities. Right, so stress has been part of the thing that we've looked at with some of the mental health and the surveys that we send out. There's a lot going on behind the scenes in terms of us studying stress further, but it's extremely hard to study. So we have a few items that I've been working on along with others here, including Dr. Hayes, that take a long time to get either funding or to launch. So we've been working on some of it for over a year, including figuring out how to best test biomarkers for stress. So that is definitely something in the works, but not full prime time. Um, another question. Are you, are you noticing that the treatment plan is different for those patients with recurrence? So say again, I, it's unclear if they mean like at the beginning, the first treatment means makes a difference in recurrence rates or? No, it's, it's, I think it says, are you noticing that the treatment plan is different for those patients with recurrence? So at present, if somebody has a second SCAD, we tend to treat it in the same way um, because it is a, a discrete event. And um, so, and because currently we do not have any specific treatments that we are, have been proven to prevent a second event, um, I guess the answer to that specific question would probably be no, because we take each event and we treat it uh, as appropriate. Hi, I'm wondering if there is any way to check for FMD that doesn't involve contrast dye. Well, if you want to screen for mild fibromuscular dysplasia, which is often what we see, we don't see, um, I'll give you two answers. So one answer is not very well because ultrasound doesn't tend to detect milder FMD. It is not a good screening test for the body. Um, if, I had to, if I were to say to somebody who either was reluctant to get imaging, didn't want any contrast, MRI contrast or CT contrast, the money would be, because of what we would treat, would be a head and neck. Because one of the concerns we would have, and probably the most likely thing that we would want to treat, would be if you had an associated brain aneurysm. So again, um, the, the studies that we would do for the most serious complication, and it's not, I think I, the other thing I say is we are not screening for FMD. We are screening for other arterial issues that might require our attention such as aneurysms or other dissections. We might find FMD as a part, because if we frame it as we're doing a test to check for FMD, um, mild FMD, you could argue, we don't need to do anything about. 
What we're looking for is the serious conditions that might go along with FMD or others. So the first answer is you can't do an ultrasound of the brain. Um, pre, you know, it, we would probably need to do some contrast. If you were opposed to contrast or felt like this was something or your doctor didn't feel like it, I think the money would be the neck, um, the neck and brain. Okay. okay. Thanks. Anybody else in the room? Um, where do you stand with aspirin? I mean, is that still protocol? What a great question, Michelle. So we cardiologists have a hard time having a patient with a heart attack on no medications, right? That's just like, just think about it if you're the regular kind of heart attack. That said, the reason aspirin has been given to patients after a heart attack of any kind is because it reduces the risk of a blood clot. So if you think about it, if somebody were having a heart attack and there was any blood clot involved, and there's been studies that have shown that, it decreases the likelihood that a blood clot would form on top of that. And so the heart attacks are smaller. That's why people give aspirin when they're having chest pain. Is there any good randomized good control to say that aspirin does SCAD patients any harm or good? I would argue no. So aspirin if you've had a stent, aspirin if you have other specific conditions, but for SCAD alone, um, because of some of these studies that have shown that if you were to have another heart attack, it limits the size, um, a lot of my patients I keep on aspirin, but if they tell me I'm bruising excessively, I'm bleeding, I have a hard time arguing the evidence that it is necessary. I think that is a question that is ripe for a randomized prospective clinical trial. Because if aspirin is beneficial, I, w I would push harder for my um, SCAD patients to be on it. And if it is not, because, particularly because we know that women, and particularly younger women, have more bleeding complications, I don't want to expose them to the risk. So great question, and one that although our, um, most of us have recommend aspirin, at least for a year, um, there isn't a lot of strong evidence for it. Yeah. Whoever gets to the microphone. I have a question about that little slide that we saw about cardiac arrest statistics. That 10% of SCAD patients present with cardiac arrest and only 1.5% on recurrence. And I wonder how that um, compares to people who have other types of heart attacks. And is that 1.5% in all recurrent SCADs or in recurrent SCADs of people who had a cardiac arrest the first time? So we can add to that yet. So actually the data for pre presentation with cardiac arrest for SCAD are not much different than cardiac arrest for other types of heart attack. And I think that speaks to a heart attack as a heart attack to a certain extent because cardiac arrest occurs because the heart is starved for blood and gets irritable and causes a, an arrhythmia that, doesn't, that isn't coordinated. So any type of heart attack that deprives even a tiny little bit of muscle so that can cause a, a cardiac arrest. So although it's hard to compare studies to studies, that is about what the heart attack it would. So if you think about it, a blockage due to SCAD produces about the same rate of cardiac arrest as others. Yeah. Yes, and then I did kind of miss the last part of your question, but it was one person who had the two cardiac arrests and then subsequently you know, had the ICD for that. But the thought is, is because SCAD can heal, that culprit is no longer there. Um, the sudden cardiac arrest didn't always occur in the first time someone had SCAD, so there was situations where someone had a SCAD, didn't have a cardiac arrest, and then had a recurrence and did. But overall, it's still quite uncommon, and it was just that one. And the reason why we point that out is a lot were hypothesizing that it was actually going to be much greater than that. So to us, we found that reassuring. However, nobody likes the idea of cardiac arrest, and that's why we're researching it, because that is a very scary component, and risk of SCAD and certainly something that we're paying attention to and our heart rhythm colleagues are also very interested too. And again, I mean, it, it, it relates to the, the response about the aspirin. So we have guidelines for implantation of implantable cardioverter defibrillators or ICDs. And if somebody has a cardiac arrest in the middle of a heart attack and has normal heart pumping function after the heart attack, we do not put in an ICD. 
But what we have seen is, perhaps because these are young people and people are more worried about them, that women who've had a cardiac arrest in the middle of a SCAD are getting ICDs. Now there are risks, psychological and physical, for getting an ICD. So one of these is trying to better understand this so women with SCAD are not over-treated with a, a treatment that is expensive, may not help them, and may harm them. So I, that's a bit of the history of why we are looking at this because um, we and Mass General have both looked at and probably, and I, I've, I see somebody, think about it, you see somebody who looks like your daughter or your wife or your sister and you were a cardiologist and they just had a cardiac arrest and you, it, you know, I'm just saying that I've seen this even though it doesn't fit the guidelines and somebody's saying, well, they might have another one. Well, patients have a cardiac arrest and have a, with a regular heart attack have another heart attack and they don't have a cardiac arrest because it's very specific to what area of the heart is, is affected. So it's an important question and what we don't want to happen is a lot of young women getting unnecessary devices that can cause considerable physical and psychological harm, which is worth doing if they need it, but certainly not if they don't. Um, Dr. Olson had a slide that um, stated that there was about 96% of male, uh, females in the genetic study. Is the, the more general SCAD study that you're doing, are there, is there a larger percentage of males in that one, or is it still pretty small? Pretty similar. <clears throat> Probably about 95% are women. So, yep. so if you know of men who have had SCAD and they're not participating, that's really important because I think a lot of us think, believe that there's probably different mechanisms at play in men versus women, and that is also a very important research topic that we'd like to explore more, but need patients to have the power. And that's, again, why it's been so wonderful to have so many people participate in this registry is because those numbers allow for the statistical power to have meaning behind the findings. If we don't have enough people participating, we don't have that power to make important comparisons. I was wondering if um, you've been able to establish a separate um, recurrence rate for either pregnant or postpartum scads? When we've looked at that, we have seen no difference in recurrence, but it is something that we will still plan or are putting into our current models looking at recurrence. We're very interested in trying to look for risk factors, but we've not seen a difference between the two. Do you know what the risk of um, being on birth control pills or using an IUD has? So for those who've filled out many of the questions on our questionnaires, it is something we're looking at very challenging to study, and a large number of women have been on something at some point in their life. So as you can imagine, to be confident in what we find is challenging. We also ask a lot about menstruation and where people were in their period, for instance, at the time of SCAD. Um, but again, <clears throat> it's challenging when you get down to the science of it and making sure that the numbers and the results are reflective of the truth. Is this the last one? Yes, I have the last online question, and I think you paid for them to do this. But anyway, <laughs> not really. Um, this is, I'll, I'll do the whole thing, but you'll see why the question is how, what you paid them to say. Okay, I've had two SCADs, first 11 years ago, second with nine years ago. I also have FMD and aneurysms. Here's your paid for question. How do I participate in the study? <laughs> All right. You email mayoscad at mayo.edu. And all you have to do is send us your name and we will get you started and you can get in this. And um, we would, if you are, if you know somebody, if you're online, because I think most everybody in here is probably clued in and, and if they're in our research, they, they want to be. But we, um, one question that comes up, are you still accepting people into research? And absolutely, because we would love to see more people who have just had SCAD, but honestly, in a registry, often that they're in a registry, there are many biases. Any study has biases. 
but one that is, is people who are online, people who are on Facebook, they may be more likely to know about it. What we really need is the people who had a SCAD 20 years ago, didn't know anything about this, went about their life, and we've had a number of those. So somebody was giving a talk at a, about SCAD and they came up and spoke to the speaker and said, well, I had one of those about 10 years ago and I didn't know any of this. We want those folks to be part of this too. Because I can tell you for you fresh SCADs, to have somebody who says, yeah, I had it 20 years ago and I've done fine with no problems, that is counterbalances those other folks and helps enrich. What is it about that person who had just one and is doing great 20 years ago? That's important for us too. So yes, we are enrolling. All you have to do is email or um, uh, you can call, but the email is probably the easiest. Thank you. I did not pay for that, but I, if, if it wasn't clear enough up on the image. so. Um, Thank you very much. This is a, an honor and pleasure to get in front of you and talk about what we do every day because I know it's something that affects you every day. Thank you.